We are coming toward the close of uh, summer, and I don't know, a lot of you hadn't been around Cowboy Church long, but we get really, really busy in the fall. And uh, really ramping up to the fall, we've become busy all throughout the year in a good way because there's several, several Bible studies going on now that you can get involved in. Uh, most of you ladies know about the upcoming ladies ministry that will get kicked off here before long. That's what the table's been in the four year for. Thank you, brother. And uh, you can get involved in that. We have an Ironman uh, breakfast and Bible study every morning here at the church. We eat at 630. Bible study starts uh, shortly after that, usually before 7. You can leave at any time you need to, depending on when, when you got to be where you got to be. And then Brother Chris has uh, started a Sunday evening Bible study here over in the Cowboy Cafe uh, over there that you can participate in. And that's no specific gender. It's for everybody, couples, singles, male, female. So there's plenty of uh, getting into God's Word around the Cowboy Church. Let me tell you why that's so important. The higher our view of God, and by the way, our view of God can never be maxed out. But the higher our view of our God is, every area of our life will excel. Does that make any sense to you? The higher you view your God, every area of your life will be enhanced, will be increased, will excel. Every area. And so that's why it's so important to get into God's Word because that's where we come to understand who our God is. You don't need to go on what somebody tells you. You don't need to go on what uh, Grandma and Grandpa used to believe. You need to go on what God's Word says to us. And that's why we are doing our dead-level best to make so many opportunities available to the church for discipleship because it's the key to growing in Christ. Amen or not? All right, if you're in uh, the Old Testament book of Daniel, this is our third week uh, that we have been in chapter 1 of Daniel. So we're not moving very quickly, but how many of you know that anytime you teach, preach, or study God's Word, the goal is not to move through it quickly, the goal is to move through it thoroughly. And so we're never going to be in a hurry when it comes to that, because after all, this is... This is God's Word to us. So we don't ever want to be in a hurry. We don't ever want to miss anything. We want to be thorough in our studies. Uh, and just to uh, kind of keep our minds right uh, about the subject of this series that we are, we're preaching uh, at the present time, determining who you are before you get there. Uh, in all the places that we find ourselves in, in this life, and no matter how you get there, uh, the fact that you're there, the, the, the ways we uh, react to where we're at, the ways that we respond to where we're at, the perspective that we have looking at the situation we're in in life, those really determine the outcome of that situation. Your perspective, the way you respond, the way you react. And so, Knowing who we are as Christians, knowing who I am as a child of God, it's imperative for me to know before I enter that situation, before I'm in that circumstance, it's imperative for me to know who I am as a child of God, as a follower of God, for me to have the right perspective, for me to have the right response, uh, and, and, and to me to react in that situation. And I cannot, you cannot. Know who you are to the fullest without knowing who your God is. And I've said this before, and you're probably going to hear me repeat this in every uh, sermon in this series. Friends, listen, we're way too shallow when it comes to knowing who our God is. There are way too many Christians who only have a, a surface knowledge of the God that they profess to follow. The God that they've put their trust in. The God that they're going to spend eternity with. We're way too shallow in our theology. And so it's imperative that we determine who God is to us. And it's imperative that we determine who we are in our relationship to our 
God. Does that make any sense? Well, amen. Thank both of you. <laughs> now, here's what we know uh, in chapter 1 of Daniel so far. First of all, we know that these four Hebrew boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they are not prisoners in Babylon by chance. It's not just happenstance. It's not bad luck, rotten luck, that they are prisoners uh, in Babylon. We know that a sovereign God has made a sovereign decision for King Nebuchadnezzar to come from the north to Jerusalem and to sack or defeat Jerusalem and Judea and to take all of the inhabitants of Judea back to Babylon and make them prisoners. We know that God caused this. This is God's fault, if you will. It's not happenstance. It's, it's God's uh, sovereign decree that they are there. We also know that these Hebrew boys here in Babylonian captivity are, are, are not, a, uh, uh, not there because of uh, collateral damage or, or anything like that. Now, we know that, that, that Daniel and his friends are godly men. They're God-fearing men. They were God-fearing men when they were in Jerusalem and Judea. And they're God-fearing men here, so they didn't just get swept away by the tide of war. Uh, they weren't just in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you're like me, I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I've gotten caught up in things that, uh, hey, uh, wasn't my fault. I just kind of got blamed with the rest of them. That ain't what's going on here. Uh, Daniel and, and his friends, they're not just kind of casualties of the war. God has got them in Babylon for a distinct purpose. And we're watching that unfold before our eyes. The third thing, if, if God takes you somewhere, he doesn't take you there alone. How many of you have figured that out in your walk with Christ? When God takes you somewhere, whether it's delightful or whether it's deadly, he doesn't send you there alone. He goes with you. And that's what we're seeing unfold in the story of Daniel. The fourth thing, Daniel and his friends... They have a firm understanding uh, that they're not in Babylon alone. And their times and their circumstances haven't changed who they are. Haven't changed who their God is. Here's one thing I've learned in the ministry so many times. When Christian folks have bad experiences, it changes everything about them. For some reason that I have never been able to figure out, so many times when God's people suffer calamities or, or, or uh, tragic times in their life, they have a tendency, as crazy as this sounds, they have a tendency to run away from God back to the world. I've never figured that out. That is the time when God's kids ought to run right into his lap. But unfortunately, so many times, that doesn't happen. Not the case with Daniel, Hananiah, Shadrach, or Azrael, and Mishael. That's not the case with them. Uh, their times, their circumstances, their situation has not changed who they are. They're still God-fearing Hebrew men, even though they are in Babylonian captivity, even though they've lost everything that they have had or ever will have, they ha it has not changed who they are. Now, today, we're going to move all the way through verses 8 through 21. I know we've already been over verse 8, but just to keep everything in context, we're going we're gonna to go through verse 8 through 21. And here's what we're going to see in these verses. We're going to see Daniel's resolve, and we're going to see God's hand. Daniel's resolve and God's hand. Now, let me explain that to you. Daniel's resolve is how he was set in who he was. He was firmly set in who he was what his God could do, and what God expected out of him. His heart was made up. We've already said that. You've heard the expression, someone's mind is made up, or you've made your mind up about something. In this situation, Daniel's heart is made up about who he is and who his God is. So that's Daniel's resolve. Uh, the King James says Daniel purposed in his heart. So the second thing we're going to see is God's hand. And that just simply means uh, this is what causes things to happen uh, in Daniel's story. This is the agent, God's hand. This is the agent that supernaturally 
causes and determines outcomes based on his will and his power. Here's the problem of 21st century Christianity. We have lost the understanding that God is sovereign. We have injected ourselves in God's place. We, we uh, put so much stock in our ability to make decisions, our ability to cause things happen. Uh, call it free will, call it whatever you want to call it. We've lost the notion that God is still sitting high and still looking low. We've not lost the notion that in the, the Christian economy, things work from the top down. They don't work from the bottom up. You're going to hear that phrase said a lot today. In a Christian's life, things are working from the top down, not from the bottom up. If it worked from the bottom up, that means that God would be waiting on us to do something. Friend, listen, God ain't waiting on you to do nothing. God's got tomorrow's paper in his back pocket. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows when it's going to happen. And he's the one who causes it to happen. Now, A lot of you, when I say things like that, you kind of give me a look like, hmm, hmm. I understand that because 21st century Christianity has lost the notion of who God is and how sovereign he is. We're more deists than we are anything. I told you what a deist was uh, last time together. We were together last Sunday. A deist is someone who believes that God created everything, but then after he created it, he just kind of let it go and said, y'all do your own thing. That ain't who God is. Do you think that things that happen in your life and in my life take God by surprise? And it's not, listen, you got to go further than that. It's not that just he knows the future. God determines the future. He's not waiting on the commercial appeal to print a paper so he can read it and figure out what's going on. God makes the news. He don't read the news. In his sovereignty, he determines everything that will happen. When we figure that out in our lives, let me tell you what's happened to me. It's set me free. I'm not under pressure to make things happen anymore. I'm not under pressure to think that I've got to do something in order for God to do something. I'm not under the pressure to think that, man, if I get this wrong, now I've been set free knowing that God is sovereign. Now, does that mean that I just lay on the couch all day and I never do anything? Of course not. I'm a big part of God's plan. You're a big part of God's plan. But as we see unfolding in Daniel, we understand that there's a sovereign God who is in control of every moment of every day. And that's the biggest thing you're going to see is God's hand at work in what's going on. Now, I want to read these scriptures to you. We're going to read from verses 8 to 21, and then we're going to go back and we're going to go through them. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse? Then the other young men your age, the king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food And treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to test them. Or he agreed uh, to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. At the end of the times set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Verse 8, first thing you see, you see Daniel's resolve. His heart's made up about who he is and who his God is. And that's why he uh, has the uh, ability, if you will, to proceed the way he's proceeding. His mind's made up. His heart's settled. His location doesn't change who he is. His circumstances and situation don't change who he is. He's still the same God-fearing Hebrew he was when they loaded him up in Jerusalem and started heading back toward Babylon. He ain't changed a bit. You know, Moses was the same way. If you've read the story of Moses when he was a young man being raised in Pharaoh's household, uh, we can read in verses 11, uh, uh, verses 24 through 26 in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it says this about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Daniel and, and Moses has a lot in common. Friend, listen, when Daniel got to Judea, his heart was made up about who he was and who his God was. Therefore, all of the circumstances that come crashing down on him did not change him one bit. That's Daniel's resolve. Verse 9, you see God's hand. Listen to me. we got to understand this. No matter how strong our resolve is, it's worthless without the supernatural hand of God working in our situation. Are you all all right? Without the supernatural hand of God working in our situation, no matter how strong we are in our will or our resolve, nothing gets done. Listen to me. The, story, the hero of this story is not Daniel. The hero of this story is the same hero of my story and your story. It's God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Without God supernaturally working in my life, no matter how hard-headed I am, no matter how strong-willed I am, no matter how much faith I have, nothing gets done. That's why in this situation you see that God's hand is presently at work in Daniel's situation. Look at verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. That's not Daniel's doings. That's God's doings. There you see the supernatural hand of God. And even when God's supernatural hand begins to work in our situation, it does not mean that there won't be opposition. Matter of fact, the very next verse, you see the opposition. Verse 10, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age. The king would then have my head because of you. The truth of the matter is, not only would he have this guard's head, he would execute his whole family. That's big stuff. So opposition immediately comes, even though Daniel has a strong resolve, and even though the supernatural hand of God is playing in on this and making things happen, causing things to happen, there's still opposition. So what does Daniel do? What do we do when we know that our God is working, but then opposition arrives? What do we do? We stand on that resolve that we have. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. Actually, verse uh, 11 through 13, you see Daniel's resolve. He's not wavering one bit. That's a problem we have. This would have been a good time to give up, by the way. This would have been a really good point in which Daniel would say, you know what, man, we just ain't going to get this done. Uh, by golly, I guess it looks like I'm just going to be a Babylonian. 
I, I'm just going to be a Chaldean from now on. I can forget about Judea. I can forget about my God. I can forget about his law. Here's a good time to jump ship. But that's not what Daniel did. Nor should we ever do that. Our resolve should always remain in the Lord, in our God and who he is. Verse 11, 12, and 13. Here's Daniel's resolve again. Daniel then said, after the opposition, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Daniel's resolve was so strong. Uh, even though the situation was facing opposition, even though there was some changes that were taking place, Daniel knows, listen to me, Daniel knows what his God has said about this situation. His God has given the law on this situation. The law says that Israelites shall not eat of an animal's blood. They cannot partake of any meat with blood in it. That's part of the Levitical law. So in order for Daniel to do this, He's got to disobey God's law. He knows what God's law says. He knows that his God is alive and powerful. He is an agent of change. He can cause things to happen. So here, Daniel, with that strong resolve, he stands on what his God has said. Therefore, he puts his God to the test. Can we do that today? Absolutely, we can. Absolutely, we should. When we know what God's word is on a matter, we should stand on that and watch what God does next. So many times we don't. What do we do? We cower. We run. Our resolve lasts about as long as Johnny stayed in the army, not very long. One of the amazing things through all of this craziness in this new era that we live on that I see happening uh, and I'm not watching every detail, but I am watching some things. One of the most amazing things that I've seen is the, uh, the resolve of, of Grace Church in California and Pastor John MacArthur. And I, I have watched him stand, not on his opinions, uh, not on what mood he's in, not on the fact that his church has been offended, He's merely standing on what God has said. Listen to me. That's what we build our resolve on. Are y'all getting this? You see, determining who we are, we have to determine who our God is. And in order for us to determine who our God is, we have to know what our God has said. When God's word says something, it is settled for eternity. There's no debate there's no situational ethics that we have to insert and figure out, is this the right thing for now? If God said it, it's absolutely settled. And so as Pastor MacArthur reads his word and he says, uh, God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together in the manner that somehow, but all the more so as you see the day approaching. Pastor MacArthur stands on it and says, God has said that the church is supposed to meet no matter what the government says. Now, I know that flies in the face of a lot of people, but that's what God's Word has said. Our resolve has to stand on God's Word. Now, if he said, well, you know, uh, I just feel like we ought to meet. I don't want to miss all them tithes. He would have been wrong. Well, I just like being with my people. That would have been wrong. But God's word has settled the matter for him. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together in the manner that some has, but even more so as you see the day approaching. So what does he do? He meets. His people meet. 
What does the government do? The government comes against him. Well, what happens? The supernatural hand of God goes to work and directs the court systems. In liberal California, we ain't talking about in good old God-blessed Arkansas. We're talking about in the, one of the most liberal states, if not the most liberal state in the nation. And it's a d- direct result of God's supernatural hand. Because you know what I was expecting? My lack of faith. You know what I was expecting? If he, if he can haul that dude off, he's going to jail. But you know he didn't. God didn't allow it. Friend, listen. Don't stand on your opinions. Don't stand on what someone else is saying. Don't stand on traditions. But you stand on God's word. We stand on God's word when it's clear on the matter. Amen or not? Daniel knows this about this situation. And Daniel is standing on that. His resolve is to the end. Verse 14, we see God's hand. Verse 14, so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. That is amazing. That is amazing that this guard and this official over the guard would put their necks out, would put their families' necks out because in those days, when a guard was punished, he wasn't punished alone. His whole family was taken out. It is absolutely amazing that this is happening. And it's nothing more than the providence of God and the power of God working in this official's life. So in verse 14, you see uh, God's hand. There's no way this pagan would have ever agreed to that without the power of God reaching into his life and changing that. Remember, this whole scene is working from the top down, not the bottom up. That's the way God's economy works. And when we have a strong resolve, we'll never be the hero of the story, but God will use that strong resolve, and he will enact his power in our situation. And that's what we see going on here. Look at verse 15. You see God's hand again. Actually, verse 15 and 16. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, just in case when you hear that word vegetable, we're from the South and Greece is an automatic part of our lifestyle. Butter is uh, there ain't nobody in this, in this church who don't have a tub of butter in their refrigerator this morning. Because if you did, you would have stopped by the store on the way to church to get you some butter. That's how much we love fat stuff. That's just who we are, amen or not. So if, when you hear that word vegetable, boy, if you're thinking about fried squash or fried okra, they ain't fried nothing in those days. If you're thinking about them green beans, that's got so much butter and oil in them that it's like an oil slick on stop. You you have to separate it to get your beans out. And then when you do pull your beans out, there's a hunk of bacon in there. That ain't, that ain't the vegetables they had. If, if you're thinking about cauliflower with grease and black pepper, if you're thinking about broccoli, oh, I love broccoli. I'm getting hungry right now. If you're thinking about broccoli with salt and pepper and butter just oozing out the bottom of your plate, that ain't the vegetables that they had. Matter of fact, that word for vegetable, in the King James, it says pulse. That's the word used in the King James, pus. What does that mean? The, the Greek word there means a vegetable, uh, or it means something that is sown. What's sown? Small seeds are sown. You don't plant your garden that way. I don't plant my garden that way. What do you plant that away? A wheat field? a barley field, chances are real good that these vegetables they're talking about was wheat or barley. Could have been, it could have been fresh vegetables, but it would have been something that was sown, like turnips. You don't get excited about turnips, do you? So what are you saying? What's your point in all that? My point is that if we look at this closely, we see God's hand at work. 
How in the world could these four Hebrew boys be slicker and fatter on the other side of those 10 days than the rest of the crew who was eating the king's royal food and drinking his wine? There's no way that those four Hebrew boys was taking in as many calories as the rest of the experiment was. There's no way that they should have looked as good. They shouldn't even looked as good as the rest of the boys in the experiment. But the Bible says not only did they look as good, the Bible says they look better. They look healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Those boys who's scarfing them pork chops down, who's got bread on the table, who's got gravy running out both sides of their mouths, they're drinking wine, they're having a big old high time, taking in all them calories. God's supernatural hand was at work with those young men who were taking in the barley and the wheat, the turnips, and drinking it down with water. The supernatural hand of God is involved in this. And it always will be when we have a strong resolve based on who our God is. Look at verse 17. You see God's hand again. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Now, this is at the end of three years. It's been three years since they arrived at Babylon. And we know, according to what we read earlier, that they have entered this program, this experiment, where they're going to be taught the literature and the language and all of that of the Chaldeans, a very advanced civilization at that time, as it were. But we see the hand of God working in these four Hebrew boys' life when we see in verse 17 that God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds. Not just literature. I mean, not just Chaldean. God gave them understanding of all kinds of literature and language. These guys were through the roof with their IQs because of what God was doing in their lives. And he went the extra mile with Daniel and gave him the ability to interpret dreams and visions. Why? Because God's going to use Daniel for his purposes. God didn't give Daniel the ability to do this for Daniel's sake. God gave Daniel the ability to do this for God's sake. God's about to use Daniel in a mighty, mighty way. You see the hand of God there in verse 17. Remember... This is working from the top down, not the bottom up. It's working from the top down. Look at verse 18 through 21. We'll close out. You see God's hand again. At the end of the time set by Daniel or by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented to Nebuchadnezzar, the king talked with them. He found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. They ride into Babylon in a war wagon, POWs, turned into lab rats. Listen to me, three years after having that resolve of God's word, after three years of standing firm on God's word, watching God's hand work through everything, they went from being POWs and lab rats now they have entered the king's service. That means they're on the king's staff in Babylon. That's what God can do for his people when they have that strong resolve to stand on his word. No matter what the circumstances are, and there couldn't have been any worse circumstances than what these boys faced. Unimaginable. They have watched the hand of God supernaturally navigate them through a place they didn't ask or deserve to come to. They didn't ask to be here. How many times have you found in your life being in a place where you didn't ask to get there? Not only did you not ask it, you didn't deserve it. I don't deserve to be going through this. Let me tell you what I think about our, our current situation in America. America don't deserve this. Because all the nuts you see on TV that's raising all the havoc, that's trying to destroy a God-fearing nation... And have no doubt that's their goal, is to destroy a God-fearing nation. There's lots of godly people that don't deserve what, what's, what's down the road. 
We're going to be entering some times that we don't want to go to. We're not going to ask to be there. I don't know about you, but on my little slice of heaven out there where I live, I ain't never got to see another human. I'll be fine. I'll be fine out there. I told somebody a while ago, look, if Walmart never existed, old brother Tracy's good. God bless them dollar generals, amen or not. I don't need all that. You don't need all that. We're going to be fine because we're the kind of people that will survive. But you know what? There's some things coming down the pike. You're going to find yourself in some situations. Listen, I, I, I'm not trying to make some doom and gloom prediction. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a preacher. But I'm telling you, life will never be as it was before. They have let them pecker woods go too far. They have done, let them do too much. They, they done got them get away with too much. If you think they're going to turn, tail, and run, you can forget that. And I know we uh, enjoy uh, uh, living here in Cross County. We've got a wonderful sheriff's department, a wonderful police department here in Wynn that watches over us and takes care of us. But friend, make no difference. As, as, as the ball keeps rolling, They'll be coming to a neighborhood near you. You better determine who you are before they get there. Better determine who your God is before they get there. You better determine what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do before it all comes down. I'm not calling you to do something silly because God's word tells us that we are law-abiding Law abiding. Nobody should fear the law like God's people should. And you better thank the Lord that you live in a place when we do have officials that watch over us and keep us safe. Friend, listen to me. When you're in the bed at night, there's police officers at work driving around, keeping you safe, making sure your stuff don't get gone. And when it does get gone, they go to get it back. Thank the Lord for them. Thank the Lord for them. But you better determine who you are in your walk with God. You better determine what you're willing to do and what God would have you to do and what he wouldn't have you to do. You better get your head in the book. You better understand who you are. Because it's going to take a strong resolve in these last days. Oh, preacher, the Lord's coming. He's going to evacuate us. Yes, he is. But do you know when? No, you don't. And I don't either. And I don't know what we'll see come down the pike. But I do know this. We better have a strong resolve. Do you realize how wicked our country is at this moment in history? Do you, have, do, do you got any idea? You're paying any attention. We live in very dark, wicked times. The leaders of our countries have no soul. They have no soul. They'll do anything. They'll say anything to get elected. They don't care. They don't reverence God. They don't fear his word. And they'll lead this country into oblivion. God's people better have a strong resolve in these last days to stand on what God has said. Believe what God has said to be a Daniel in these last days. You do the math on what we've read on these 12 verses that we've looked at today. Five times... You see God's hand at work. Twice, only twice do you see Daniel's resolve. What does that mean? That means, as we've already said and confirms as we've already said, in the economy of the Christian, in the life of the Christian here on planet Earth, things work from the top down, not the bottom up. God's hand at work in our lives is what's going to see us through this. But we have to have a strong resolve. Daniel would have never been the man he is. This book would have been written totally different if God's hand was not at work in his life. 
determining who we are and determining who our God is calls us to understand that in all situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in, that for God's people, life is working from the top down, not the bottom up. You may find yourself in situations, and I may find myself in situations that surprise us, but we ought to know that it never surprises God. Not one bit, not one iota is our God ever surprised. As we move further and further into this new era of darkness, we must determine as God's people to have a strong resolve like Daniel. I can't emphasize that enough. We better make our hearts up who our God is and who we are in our God. And when we do, no matter how dark it gets, no matter what comes down the pike, no matter where we find ourselves at, we will always see the hand of God working in our lives and for us. Amen or not?